All right, welcome everyone to today's ALTA Insights webinar. These are our presentations. We offer all issues important to title and settlement professionals. I'm Jeremy Yowie, ALTA's Vice President of Communications. And today we've got a great webinar lined up that's gonna dig into uh, several recent uh, state and federal legislative efforts aimed to allow for record shielding and privacy me measures in, in public land records. Our speaker is going to um, you know, share what's happening in other states and discuss some effective solutions. And you know, ultimately, we hope uh, you walk away with some best practices. Uh, privacy legislation is passed in your state. Uh, before starting, I do need to touch on a uh, few of our housekeeping items. You can download a copy of the presentation from the handout section uh, in the GoToWebinar web, uh, window. Uh, you'll also find a, a few other documents including best practices and FAQs that uh, ALCA has developed with PRIA. Um, everyone's lines, uh, well not everyone's, <laughs> the uh, participant lines are, are uh, muted for today's discussion. And if you have any questions, please submit them through the questions box. We'll hold some time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. Um, our webinar is being recorded. A uh, link to the recording will be sent to everyone tomorrow. And you can always find the archive of our, our webinars at alta.org forward slash webinars. Also need to note that uh, today's webinar does offer CE and CLE, CLE credit for many states. Um, credit is only available if you're attending the live presentation. So you, know, you need to stick with us throughout, drop off, uh, sorry. <laughs> and uh, our platform does track attendance. So uh, no multitasking out there. Uh, also, to meet compliance uh, with state requirements, uh, there will be a few poll questions during the webinar, monitoring your uh, attentiveness, so um, watch out for those. And at the end of the presentation, I'll post a, a link uh, um, in the chat box that uh, will provide information, so you can provide information to us that we, so we can report your CE, CLE credits. Uh, any questions about the uh, education credits, uh, send an email to education at alta.org. Also need to extend a thank you to Old Republic National Title Insurance Company uh, for sponsoring our webinar today. And uh, before introducing uh, today's speakers, I do have a short message from Old Republic. So let me get that fired up. Behind every agent are the people who care and devote their time, talent, and resources to helping you achieve your business goals. You are driven to succeed, regardless of the conditions, circumstances, or challenges of an evolving marketplace. Like you, Older public title is driven, agency driven. And we're here to support you every step of the way. We will drive into uh, introducing today's speakers. Join us today, we've got Elizabeth Riley. Uh, Elizabeth is Senior Privacy Counsel as well as Regulatory and Compliance Counsel for Fidelity National Financial. And we also have Steve Jaden. Steve is Senior Vice President and Chief Privacy Officer for Old Republic Title. Elizabeth chairs ALCA's data, data privacy work group, and Steve is also a member of this important group that is tackling a lot of a lot of separate issues that kind of you know dovetail out out of this privacy issue. Uh, and also joining us today and going to lead the, the discussion is Elizabeth Blosser. 
Uh, Elizabeth is ALTA's Vice President of Government Affairs and uh, also leads ALTA's data privacy efforts and coordinates with many other groups on this issue. And with that, I'll turn the, the presentation over to you, Elizabeth. Great. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Thanks to all of you for joining us. And a special thank you to Liz and Steve for sharing your expertise with us. We're certainly fortunate to have you uh, working with us in the industry, helping us navigate these issues. Redaction and record shielding have become a hot topic over the course of the last couple of years, specifically over the course of the last um, eight to 10 months, frankly. And so we wanna make sure you have all of the information you need to know what's out there and what's coming. So here are some of the things we're gonna cover. We're gonna start out by talking about redaction and record shielding and data privacy, what it is, what it isn't, uh, how all of these pieces fit together in the big data privacy puzzle. We're going to talk about impact to your business uh, when these types of legislative initiatives pass. We're also going to talk about some effective solutions that uh, we have identified that can accomplish the twofold goal of really protecting the privacy of at-risk individuals while maintaining their ability to buy, sell, or refinance property. And then we are going to touch on some of the state and federal legislative initiatives that are out there that have passed recently or that are still active. So we can go to the next slide and dive right in. Steve, I'm gonna put you into the hot seat uh, first and pitch the first question over to you. So your uh, home state is California and California has definitely been the leader when it comes to data privacy. They were kind of the first out of the gate to push uh, data privacy legislation at the state level. And I think it would be beneficial if we could just hear from you, what are some of the things that are driving uh, data privacy uh, policy proposals uh, on the state and federal levels? And what's driving this inclusion of things like the land records uh, and documents that we've always thought of as public records? Well, thank you, Elizabeth, and it's it's a pleasure to be here and be part of this panel. Um, certainly, California has been the leader in the U.S. Uh, with the implementation of the California Consumer Privacy Act (CCPA), um, and then the subsequent ballot initiative called the California Privacy Rights Act of 2020 (CPRA). Um, similar to the laws implemented in the European Union known as GDPR. You know, all of this is in an effort to address consumer privacy, provide transparency to consumers about their rights, especially when it comes to data brokers, businesses designed to sell consumer data. These are where some of these sensitivities are coming from. While our industry is not focused on selling consumer data, many of our member companies are subject to the laws. Laws like CCPA also have some exemptions when it comes to certain public records. Um, which is somewhat beneficial, but we, you know, we're hitting a moving target as well in California with a new privacy enforcement agency uh, that had their initial meeting um, actually last week. So where the uh, California Attorney General has actually been the enforcement on this, now there's a new dedicated agency. Uh, it's become apparent that the state is learning to set up a new agency. It, it doesn't happen every day. Um, and where that is going to drive things is going to be very interesting. Um, and where the rules and the regulations come into play. And of course, as you mentioned, Elizabeth, you know, the climate continues to change and evolve and the sensitivities increased dramatically over the last year over certain classes wanting public information shielding shielded from the public records. Most notably is Daniel's Law in New Jersey. And we'll talk about that in a bit. But that's, there's a lot being driven and changed. Yeah, and to your point, it'll be interesting too to see how all of these laws are regulated as time goes by. So Liz, how does redaction in the land records fit into this big data privacy puzzle that's coming together? Well, first, just thanks for having me today. It's good to be with both of you and to talk about this subject. And, you know, really redaction and privacy 
we're, when we talk about redaction, we're talking about removal of information from the public records on the basis of an exemption from publication. So generally, public records laws provide that when a government record contains information exempt from disclosure, then the agency has to remove that information from a copy of the record before producing it to the public. And the conversation about privacy, we typically don't talk much about public records. What Steve talked about, CCPA, uh, you know, comprehensive data privacy law, and a lot of other privacy laws out there, including GLBA, specifically exempt public record information from, from the definition of you know, personal information that's to be protected under those privacy laws. So it's not in the context of typical consumer privacy rights that we talk about redaction. It's in the context of, of you know, removal of this information from the public records for a, for a safety purpose, uh, intending to shield folks whose information is, puts them at heightened risk if it's exposed to the public. And I know we'll get into that further, but generally, you know, the there can be a, a natural contradiction when we're talking about privacy and public records. Uh, public records laws generally, you know, favor open government. And so when you're talking about removing information from those records, it could be a significant concern, you know, from an open government perspective. And so typically these laws are narrowly construed um, in, in favor of the public and limited purpose that they serve. Uh, but we're seeing that expansion, you know, across the board with, with states seeking to remove information from public records. Removing information from public records isn't necessarily new. I mean, over the course of the last couple of decades, uh, we've seen redaction of other types of things from, from the land records. Can you talk a little bit about that, Liz? Yeah, you're absolutely right, Elizabeth. Social security number is a good example of information that for a long time we've expected to be removed from public records. Um, and, and if a government agency collects that information, it shields or protects that information before it produces a record. I mean, court records as well, you know, it, whether the onus is on a, the clerk or the person, you know, filing a record, typically social security number is required to be omitted from, from the record. Driver's license number is another one. You know, it's the type of information like social security number where making that information available to the public creates a broad risk. And so for the public interest of, of protecting against fraud, that information is removed from public records. What we're seeing now is a shift. The types of information that are excluded from public records are expanding to include things like name, um, home address information, other identifying information that we haven't typically considered you know, sensitive information or information that creates a risk of fraud. And really what it is, is it's the combination of data points that create the risk, right? Right, the expanded redaction efforts today, they're not so much focused on protecting the privacy of a, an individual, they're focused on protecting the safety of an individual and so, providing a combination of name and home address in the public records. Um, if someone is a, a public official who has, you know, faces a heightened risk of, of potential harm or violence because of their role, what they do, or a crime victim, you know, publishing their name and their home address could create a significant safety risk for them. So I feel like we've got a little bit of acronym soup going on here, lots of terminology. We love our terminology in the, the title industry. So if we were to give like the Cliff Notes version of this, just to make sure everybody sort of understands how all this fits together. Data privacy laws are really about a consumer's rights related to their personal information. Redaction laws are really about removing information from the public record that could be uh, harmful if if disclosed, whether it's a single data point or a combination data point. 
And when we think about record shielding, that's less about the actual blacking out or redaction of information, but the, sh the, sh the shielding of certain information from general public access. Is that an anything you would add to that? Is I don't hear any additions, so hopefully we hopefully I got that right. Elizabeth, you nailed it. it. Yeah. <laughs> In stereo. Awesome. So Steve, uh, how prevalent do you think these efforts specifically in the redaction record shielding space as it relates to land records? How prevalent do you think uh, these changes and pieces of legislation are going to be over the course of the next year or two years? Well, I think it's going to become very prevalent, and it already is. Um, as we've seen across the nation over the last year, uh, there's been as many as 24 plus states that have entered in some type of, of shielding or redaction type of legislation. The most notable driver in this area was out of New Jersey. Um, and I'm sure you all recall the press on this matter last July. It's, it's pretty tragic. Um, and if you aren't familiar or haven't actually looked at this. You should really look it up. I encourage you to do so. Um, it, it was really Daniel, uh, son of Judge Esther Salas of the U.S. District Court for the District of New Jersey, was tragically killed on July 19, 2020, so a little over a year ago, when an armed assailant, a deranged attorney who had appeared in a case before Judge Salas, went to her home and opened fire. Daniel was 20. Judge Salas's husband was also shot in the attack. Um, there was a New York Times article that was actually written by Judge Salas herself, um, and I'm quoting parts of it. I was down in the basement with my son Daniel when the doorbell rang. Daniel raced up the stairs. Seconds later, as I stood alone in our basement, my beloved son was shot to death. Mark, my husband of 25 years, was shot three times and critically injured. This tragedy happened for a reason wholly unrelated to either my husband or my son, but because of my job. I'm a United States District Court judge. A lawyer who had appeared before me was angered by the pace of a lawsuit he had filed in my court. He came to my home seeking revenge. My attacker sought to hurt me, but his ire his, and focus was not unique. Federal judges are at risk from other would-be attackers. Um, once again, that was in the New York Times, but it really is the emotion and tragedy of this event that received national media coverage. Uh, there was even like a 60 Minutes um, event on this and resulted in a shielding law that quickly was enacted in New Jersey. And this truly put this issue in the forefront. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Anna on our staff has been tracking a lot of the media related to this this issue and just uh, redaction and record shielding in general. And since uh, last year, I think we're up to four or five pages, single space links to articles. And as you mentioned, Steve, a lot of that is big publications, things like the, the Today Show. Um, really featuring this, and it is a heartbreaking uh, story. And I, I do encourage people, as you said, Steve, to go and watch some of the, the video um, and, and really understand the, the concerns that are being shared about the safety of at-risk groups and specifically uh, judges. So Liz, kind of given all these factors, how do we as an industry need to address this issue or approach this issue because it's a, it's a difficult one to wade into. It is difficult, Elizabeth, and I, I think it's important to remember that, I mean, these are incredibly well-intentioned efforts and necessary efforts to protect the safety of public officials, but the unintended negative consequence of these efforts is that information that's essential to the land records and essential to what we do as title professionals um, is being impacted. You know, name, property address, legal description are now being removed or redacted from, from land records. And then, so this has a significant impact on our industry as well as, you know, just the, the ability to, to convey um, real estate. And so keeping that in mind, 
And we certainly have to be advocates for our issues and experts at the table who understand the use of the land records and how this could negatively, how this effort to you know, pass these redaction laws could impact that. At the same time, we very much have to be sensitive to the safety concerns of the at-risk groups. These are legitimate concerns. Um, and so we need to come to the table, able to provide thoughtful solutions, appreciating that change is coming. You know, main, maintaining the status quo probably isn't a viable option for our industry but making sure that any thoughtful solution we put out there addresses the safety concerns of these at-risk groups but you know absolutely also protects um the ability of people to buy sell and, and refinance property and and help educate lawmakers and you know other interested parties on the issues that are of concern to us um in in terms of advocating for solutions that that address both and Liz, you've done a great job with your education efforts, and I know you and your team have come up with a flowchart. And if we move to the next slide, we can take a look at um, this graphic about how uh, land records are used in a real estate transaction. Can you walk us through this uh, real quick, Liz? Yes, and, and shout out to the far more creative and technical people at FNF that that I'll tweet this. This was a very limited effort on my part. Um, but really what this workflow shows, and this is a workflow showing a Florida transaction. So recognizing that for the folks on the call, there may be differences depending upon your jurisdiction, your, your location in the United States. But what this um, graphic is designed to show is really the steps in a residential real estate transaction and, and the frequency with which public land records and other public records, including property appraisers records and, and tax collector records are accessed, not just by our industry, but others involved in the real estate transaction. Um, and, and just really showing, I think it, it shows, you know, one, how much a real estate transaction relies on the public availability of information relating to a particular property. Two, the number of government agencies that are potentially involved in a real estate transaction. And so if these government agencies are all applying redaction requirements differently, it could compound the issue. But three also shows that how many points in the process a redaction could, could hang up or, or throw off you know, a transaction, whether or not it means it prevents a transaction from occurring at all, or it, perhaps it's just a delay. Yeah, this is a great tool. I think good for speaking with lawmakers, but also industry partners like uh, county recorders, clerks, uh, lenders, uh, realtors, and others. So we've now come to uh, the part of our broadcast where we have our first test that Jeremy was talking about. I feel like, and yes, there will be a test. This one is a, pre a pretty easy one. Um, Jeremy, I think you've launched the poll. The question being, have you seen examples of redaction in your local land records um, in the course of uh, conducting transactions? Yeah, fortunately, it's not a, uh, you know, right or wrong answer here so you know everyone passes they just have to answer <laughs> excellent <laughs> you get about 10 more seconds and we're going to close it and uh got about uh actually two-thirds of everyone who's voted said uh yes they have seen examples of redaction in their local land records so you know 68 percent now um go ahead and close it and we'll uh go ahead and get back to uh the presentation Excellent. Well, um, if we move to the next slide, we're if, for those who haven't seen an example, uh, we've got one uh, teed up here for you. We've actually got a handful um, that we just want to walk through. And Liz, I know you've got uh, some information on this this first one that kind of highlights how oftentimes redaction can give folks a false sense of security because information can be redacted in one place, but not necessarily redacted everywhere throughout uh, publicly available records. 
That's right, Elizabeth. And, and that's one of the issues that we see with redaction of the public land records is just the the false sense of security and, and the, the opportunity for error um, with potential significant repercussions. But this example, notice of termination, uh, shows it's from Florida. And so in Florida, the legal description, property ID, any information uh, relating to or that could identify a property by law can be redacted for about 35 different protected um, classes. And so this is one example where the legal description of the property, the property ID, folio number is redacted. Amazingly, it references a notices, notice of commencement, provides a book and page, and if you pull up that document, the legal description is not redacted. So somebody who was looking in the land records seeking to find somebody, even if the legal description is redacted here, there's certainly some crumbs um, that would enable them to find the location, the home address of the protected party just a, just a few clicks away. Yeah, which is why uniformity and standards in terms of implementation becomes so important so that you can get to that two, twofold goal of making sure you're protecting folks, but um, still having access to certain folks to make sure real estate transactions continue. I think we've got two more examples here, Liz, that you provided. Yeah, and this is just another example, um, uh, you know, of a redacted address and it also redacts the property ID in the legal description and just comment here for title examiners or those doing searches by geographical description by legal description by property information you know redacting this information if you're if you're limited to a geo search and you're searching by um, the legal description, you're not going to find this particular document because all of that information has been removed both on the document and in the index. Uh, next slide, please. And this one's a bit of a, a double whammy. In, in Florida, spouse, spouse's name of a protected party can also be redacted. And so you see the consequence where you have a, a spouse whose information is removed as well as a legal description and parcel ID number for a property. So here, if you're doing a grantor grantee search, you wouldn't find the one party or a legal description geo search, you're not going to find the, the property. So literally have a blind spot um, in searching for information documentation relating to this property based upon the, the redaction schema in Florida. And Steve, I know you've you're part of the uh, 68 plus percent who've also seen redacted records come across your desk. What types of things have have you seen? Well, certainly, I, you know, Liz's examples are kind of tidy and neat. Um, they're not always that way, uh, and they're not always consistent or correct. Um, one of the things that I've seen a number of times. Um, on an electronic document is somebody changing the text from black to white, thinking that nobody can see it anymore. Um, and then from an electronic perspective, if you mouse over that, it's abundantly clear the text that was there. So it's not redacted at all, um, which gets into the whole consistent, inconsistent way. I've also seen a black marker used in not a real neat, tidy way, the, uh, of what's seen on the screen right now, um, but where it can bleed through, it can damage uh, if there's if they're paper documents and they're stacked when that redaction's done with a magic marker. Sometimes it bleeds through and takes out some other critical um, reference to something that we need in a subsequent document. Um, and it also, if not done well, you can actually still read the text. And it's not a, it's not redacted. You can put it up to a light, um, and it takes very little. So there's there, you know, um, these are very appropriately redacted, though harmful, <laughs> especially if they're not indexed right. And there's no way to do that. But yeah, some of the other ways that that I've seen are are horrendous out there. Uh, we can move to the next slide and. Uh... Obviously, these redaction measures have unintended 
consequences. I think they um, all are very well intentioned and we agree that at-risk parties need to be protected, but these unintended consequences impact um, our industry. And so Steve, from a you know title industry business perspective, can you walk through some of these potential transaction issues that can come up? Oh, you bet. And certainly, depending on the law, the impl implementation and focus, there can be a varied impact. But no matter how limited a redaction requirement may be, it always has some impact on our industry. Um, all of which takes time. And as Liz has mentioned, you know, worst case scenario is a transaction uh, cannot close and record because of something that is is an issue. There's a number of bullets here, but I'd like to really go through them so everybody has a real good flavor as far as what we're talking about. So um, the inability to verify ownership, the property boundaries, legal access, right of others, homestead, um, all of those are very, very real. If, if there's parts that have been redacted and that you cannot uncover for purposes of what we're trying to do. Um, the delays, we've talked about that. And though there are delays that may impact a rate lock today, um, and we'll probably discuss this again, but often we're like the last touch in a transaction. And if there's a delay regarding a, a rate lock loss or something like that, we end up holding the bag. Um, so that's something we need to be very sensitive to. A surveyor, they have to have um, unredacted legal descriptions to perform a survey, uh, as Liz mentioned in the examples that she was showing. Um, indexing is ex extremely important. And if redacted documents index under a common name um, and not appropriately searchable, uh, it causes an incredible amount of problems. Um, as we also mentioned, redaction could result in a total failure. And if it's inconsistent in how it's being handled, um, that inconsistency can also provide a lot of issues for the consumer um, and for title professionals. And we'll talk a little about inconsistency. Liz, one thing that you talk a lot about when it comes to potential problems is compounding impacts. Can you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely, it, it, and I think this problem is is well illustrated by Florida's present law, which you know, Bill addressing this was passed by the legislature, so we assume the law will be changed here very soon. Uh, but in Florida, legal description, property ID name can all be redacted from the land records, um, and the current Florida law provides no mechanism to restore those records after the redaction is made. So a party, a protected party goes to the clerk, completes the documentation to have their information redacted from the land records. They identify the records to be redacted and the clerk applies the redaction over the publicly available document. The only mechanism to unredact the records right now in the Florida law is that same protected party going in and, and seeking to have their records restored, which they don't have to do. Uh, it would probably likely be a very voluntary thing that they would do if they were, you know, needed to refinance or do something else where there was a requirement to restore the records. Otherwise, these redactions happen and they're really never to be thought of again. So uh, it essentially creates holes, permanently alters the land records. It creates gaps in the chain of title. And so over time, as a protected parties, you know, a record was recorded many years ago, we we're unable to locate protected parties to address the issues that they could cause um, within the chain of title and to seek to resolve those issues. Then you could see, as Steve mentioned, the total failure of a real estate transaction. We cannot ensure because there is a a gap in the chain of title that we were unable to insure over. And so for Florida, that was what you know we communicated to lawmakers. I mean, it's the long-term impact. This law has been in effect, the Florida law that provided no means to restore records. 
had been in effect for a short time, so we hadn't yet seen these long-term consequences. And our goal is to get in front of those potential long-term consequences before they occur. Well, I think when you think about compounding too, you think about the various groups that could be considered at risk over time. There's been a focus on uh, judges certainly, but there can you know be other other groups and other groups certainly are protected in, in certain places. I think there was legislation in one state this year to protect lottery winners. Um, from having their information uh, disclosed. So uh, certainly there's also the compounding impact of, of more and more groups being, being added. And I know when I talk to county clerks and recorders, you know, one of their major concerns is always do I have to balance having multiple land record data sets? Like there's the real set and then there's the publicly available set. And, and so lots of questions uh, here. I think I have a couple, but it's you know an interesting story about New Jersey is their their law was you know certainly well intentioned, passed quickly through the legislature as many of these laws do, and uh, ultimately the state legislature voted to push off uh, the enactment date of that legislation and take a look at it again. And from what I understand from uh, the the county offices there is that was done because it was election time and state legislators mm -hmm. went to county offices and they said hey we need the voter files because we're going to do mailings and phone calls and go knock on some doors although I don't, I don't know that many people did that during COVID but um, the county offices said hey sorry we have no way of identifying who is a judge in our files and so we cannot release the voter files to you and so ultimately that was a, a big driver in the discussion there so even things to think about outside um, of our industry with all of this uh i guess to both uh both of you there's a lot of unintended consequences but what do you think is the most dangerous what sort of would keep you awake at night in terms of the potential consequences of of these bills well, I, I know from my perspective, it's it's really more the delay and um, it, it, the, the costs associated with uh, rate locks lost. Um, a total failure. I mean, we, we are unbelievably talented as an industry um, and generally we'll navigate away. Um, a total failure is, is not good, obviously, for anybody. Um, but I, at least that would, the, the affecting the loan, loan lock and approvals is that, that would be my, my big ticket item. Yeah, Steve, that's a big one. I think on top of that, I mean, just personally, the false sense of security that may be created for some people seeking to avail themselves of this protection, the number of examples we have of redactions that were not properly applied by clerks or recorders and still show property address information, you know, the level of additional use within, I mean, with the internet, you have a cell phone, you have a computer, it's really easy to find out where somebody lives. And so the source of origin might be the land records um, of that address information, but it proliferates um, considerably. Right within the internet you know i think um judge corrigan in the middle district of florida he he survived an assassination attempt a, a guy who had a case before him didn't like his ruling and so shot him you know shot at him um in his home you know one night they, he and his wife had just come home from a wedding he was watching tv and missed him i think it's 1.6 inches missed him you know from 50 feet away with a rifle um you know, missed his head by 1.6 inches. And and in an op-ed, Judge Corrigan said, you know, he bought my information, he bought my home address information online for $1.95. So it's it's a considerable risk for those for whom it is a risk, right? And and so just that false sense of, of security potentially created for, for some of these people is is a concern. And and also, you know, Steve is as you mentioned, I mean, we are we're a group that, you know, that land title industry, I mean, COVID has been a great example of 
you know, this is an industry of problem solvers. You know, the, the pivoting and flexibility um, within COVID, it was just huge um, across our industry. And so our ability to accommodate, you know, transaction amid a bunch of redactions, I imagine, you know, we're as creative as, we will be as creative as we can be to continue to serve our, our customers. But yeah, as the redactions continue, if there's not attention to re restoration of the records, that that is my other big concern, as the proliferation of the issue over time. Well, if we go to the next slide, I think we can move to, to the good news, and that is that there are some effective solutions when it comes to legislation that people can take a look at. Uh, some of them that have been in effect for some time, looking at Arizona's law, that's been a, in effect for almost 25 years and has, has worked uh, well. I think if you talk to the uh, county recorders there, uh, it was something that was overwhelming when they first started implementation, but as time has gone by, um, they, they figured out effective ways to do it. So Liz, can you talk us through these two approaches to uh, legislation that protects at-risk parties? Yes, and these approaches, I mean, it's interesting because they show that there are two very different ways to solve for you know the same underlying issue. Arizona's model that as a slide shows the process starts with a protected party going to their employer you know government agency and filing an affidavit which the employer submits on behalf of the protected party to the court that seeks to protect the home address information um, from public availability so seeks to shield it within the government records the court will hear i think it's once a quarter um the court will hear all of those applications and enter an order that shields that information for a period of five years. And as Elizabeth said, initially, you know, it was a lot of work for the clerks to come up with their process, but now they have a rinse and repeat process. So um, one year prior to the expiration of the court order, the clerk will send a notice to that protected party and notify them that the protection is about to expire and that they need to renew it. So they would go through the same process again. What's great for our industry about the Arizona model is that there's statutory protection for access to the records for our industry, for title insurers, title agents, escrow agents, um, seeking to use the information for, for real estate related purposes, and also provides access to other government agencies who would need access to the information. Minnesota's approach um, is, is a different one, and, and that is through their Safe at Home program. There are around 40 states, I believe, um, that have Safe at Home programs. They're operated either through a state agency, I think most common is the Attorney General's Office or the Secretary of State, and in Minnesota is operated by the Secretary of State. Maryland as well, which has a very similar model. And the Safe at Home programs have been around since the 90s, and they started as really um, sort of mail forwarding programs of victims of, of certain victims of crimes or other parties who have a risk when the, their home address information is disclosed can avail themselves of the program where they enroll with the Secretary of State's office and they use the Secretary of State's office or a PO box associated with the Secretary of State's office for their mail. That mail is received, it's processed by the Secretary of State's office who then forwards it on to the protected party. So that's really, I think in most states, um, what the Safe at Home uh, program entails. And then in Minnesota and Maryland, they've worked to find effective solutions to assist protected parties with the transfer of real estate, with the buying of real estate. In Minnesota, to buy real estate through the Safe at Home program, the participant has to be enrolled in the program before they even sign the purchase contract. So from the beginning, their information is protected, is subject to confidentiality of the from the beginning of the real estate transaction process. And then the Secretary of State's office works with the parties to make sure that the confidentiality of 
the buyer's um, location is maintained. And, and so the deed that is recorded is, a, it's, a, it's a deed, it's a place, but it's a placeholder. Instead of the um, party's name, it uses a number that associates to the Secretary of State Safe at Home program. And so somebody who's, you know, examining title there's no gap in the chain of title. All of the documentation that needs to be there is there, but there's also no disclosure of the protected party's home address information. For somebody who is examining title, they can get in touch with the Secretary of State's office who then gets in touch with the protected party to make sure that they approve of the sharing of their, their actual, you know, their information with a title agent or, or you know, another legitimate party who's in, engaging in a title search. There's a natural expiration for the Secretary of State's Safe at Home program. An eligible person has to continue to be able to certify eligibility every four or five years. And if there were a transfer of the property that's subject to the Safe at Home program, that, you know, the, the information that's been previously shielded is released upon the transfer. Two really great approaches that, that still allow transactions to go forward, but also are legitimately protecting the at-risk parties. If we move to the next slide, uh, the Alta Redaction Work Group worked with PREA Property Records Industry Association, which is comprised of a lot of uh, county clerks and recorders, to come up with some best practices um, when it comes to implementation of these types of laws, but a lot of these points are really things to consider when you're drafting the laws as well. So they reflect what's happened in either Arizona or Minnesota. Uh, Steve, can you walk us through some of these uh, best practices? Oh, you bet. And it, it, you know, as Liz was talking about Arizona and the the statutory, you know right for title professionals, people in our industry, to have access to the appropriate records is really key in this first bullet. When we're talking about permissioned access, um, there needs to be, as, as Elizabeth mentioned, when, when you're thinking or running across some pending legislation, these are the these are kind of the punch lists you wanna go through. So permission access should be made available someone with a signed release from the protected individual court order. So there needs to be good documentation associated with the protected individual and why. Licensed professionals with existing consumer privacy confidentiality requirements, you know, that, that would be our industry that we're already falling under other privacy and confidentiality rules of, you know, like Graham Leach Bliley, et cetera. These are things that are something that need to be kept in the back of one's mind. And then licensed entities with a signed confidentiality agreement with a government entity. So, um, and, and as Elizabeth mentioned, this was really a, a kind of a work effort between Alta and um, Priya to come up with these best practices. Um, statewide uniform standards and processes must be followed to ensure all records pertaining to an individual are properly shielded. Shielded. Now, this is something that is a desire. It's certainly something that we think is a best practice. From a practical perspective, we also know statewide uniform standards can be a challenge um, uh, adopting, and which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, we've also talked about the indexing when we were talking about problems. And if things are not easily accessible and indexed appropriately, so the gen general index must not shield or redact the full combination of the name and address. Um, it just makes search and exam extremely complicated if we don't have this. And the records must be discoverable within the public records index. Um, and acknowledging that there should be a flag indicating the document has been shielded. Uh, next slide. So the shielding request should be time limited. Um, once again, as Liz was going through Arizona, um, that was a four to six year. Those are, those are things that are very, very important to make sure that these aren't indefinite and that they have, a, they have an expiration. Um, and whether or not somebody go, there's a renewal process, that's something that can, can happen. 
a process for record restoration must exist to facilitate our the transactions that we're dealing with or the administration of a will. Um, there needs to be authorized access to shield the government record should be available electronically. Now this bullet was a little bit COVID related because we wanted to talk about shielded government records should be available electronically as well as in person to allow for social distancing measures. Um, so know that you know electronic records are always ideal, but we also know out of all the counties and parishes, et cetera, not everything's electronic. Um, big metropolitan areas are. Government entities and third parties should maintain robust records to track and log access of shielding records. So that's really our wrap up for the, the best practices. And there was an awful lot of effort that went into boiling this down into digestible, um, hopefully bullets that can be communicated to lawmakers if, if you're running into this in your state. So those are the, those are the best practices. Thanks, Steve. Uh, if we move to the next slide here, we'll take a look at some of the legislative activity. Uh, a picture is worth a thousand words, and this map tells quite the story. Uh, Liz, can you talk to us uh, about some of the states that have had active legislation this year? Yeah, the picture is worth a, a lot of words here. And so, as you can see, there's a lot of purple on the slide, which means there was a lot of legislative activity on the subject of redaction. Predominantly, the theme for a lot of states was updating existing shielding laws and to add additional protected classes of individuals. We saw that in you know, a number of states in the Midwest, uh, Florida as well, Arizona, I believe also expanded classes and um, mm -hmm. added to its program that way. We did have some states that introduced uh, safe at home programs. Those address shielding programs run through the Secretary of State's and Attorney's General offices. And there are a lot of states, I believe Delaware, North Carolina, um, Connecticut may still have legislation in progress that seeks to introduce a law similar to Daniel's law in New Jersey, you know, protecting information of, of judges um, within the state land records. All right, if we move to the next slide, I think we have our next poll question. The last test, um, has your state considered privacy legislation that would impact the local land records? So, We'll launch that poll and give you a couple seconds. How are results looking, Jeremy? Uh, about three quarters saying yes. Yeah, Cer certainly a lot happening in this area. And um, if there's not a lot happening in your area, there is stuff happening federally, which we're going to talk about next. All right, we got about only two thirds of you have voted, so we're going to close this. So uh, mark your yes or no. We've got about five more seconds here. I, we need to play some like Jeopardy music in the background during this. Yeah, at times I do on that, but you know I'm just not feeling it today. So we're going to head close it. Stayed about three quarters said yes, so didn't change. Okay. So on the next slide, um, there's some information about federal legislation that has been introduced uh, specifically related to federal judges and federal um, records. Uh, this legislation was introduced last year by uh, members of the congressional delegation from New Jersey who were obviously well aware of um, this tragic shooting in the state. Uh, the legislation uh, has been supported by a lot of key members of Congress, including a lot of prominent members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, so while it didn't pass last uh, Congress, we think that there is a good chance it will pass this Congress. We anticipate the uh, bill will be dropped again in the Senate uh, initially and then followed in the House, and we anticipate that any day now. Uh, we do have some good news on this, though. The uh, 
Alta work group was able to meet with Senate offices, specifically Senator Menendez's office. They've been very responsive to our requests and concerns. And Steve, do you want to talk about the couple of things that we've we've asked them to modify in the language when they reintroduce? Oh, you bet. One of one of the key things that we were able to uh, address um, was making sure we, our definition of data broker was used. And a lot of that was, you know, as we we all have uh, title plants that we work with, and trying to make sure that we're we're following, you know, supporting of that. Is about half the states' laws require title insurers. Um, to maintain replicas of the of these public records, so we needed to make sure that that was protected appropriately. And um, the data broker definition that we provided was adopted, um, which was extremely a, a, a real big win. Um, the other piece that was a, a big win was a Grand Leach Bliley Act carve out. Uh, once again, these are this was extremely critical um, that has been at least adopted into this draft. And then the last piece that we're really excited about is we've talked about permission access and how important that is. There's language that we've, we've provided and we hope to see that here in any moment. But those are, our, those are three big wins that has really been a big effort from this group. Yeah, it, it really is. And I'm hopeful that we can get to a place where the the language that's introduced reflects kind of what we need and we as an industry can be supportive of this measure so that we have a seat at the table. And if we go to the last slide, uh, kind of thinking about advocate advocacy and the need to be at the table as part of these discussions because we are the experts um, in this area along with county clerks and recorders. Liz, uh, you've focused a lot on this issue in Florida. What is your number one tip for people who are working on legislation in their states? The number one tip may be that first thing on the on the slide. You know, advocating for the status quo is not going to work. So so coming to the table with an effective solution and as a willing partner in you know working toward the goal of protecting safety of these parties but at the same time ensuring that you know we maintain constructive notice access to the records um the issues that are of concern to us i mean that's it i mean there's no better advocate for you know uh, our industry than us i mean lawmakers can real estate transactions are complicated you know so so if we're at the table and we're able to explain to them how we can come up with a solution that that works to protect their interests but also ours um, that's incredibly helpful I think to our industry in, in making sure that no matter you know the 2021 legislative map that we looked at so many states added additional protected classes to their redaction laws. And, and so long as we have a solution um, that protects, you know, those things that we've talked about, the continued sale um, and, and transfer of real estate interests, then it doesn't really matter how many state, you know, how many more protected classes are added um, to these state laws. And, and so I think that's that's the goal is, is being being a partner in an effective solution. Great advice. Well, this hour has flown by. We have a ton of stuff we didn't get to, but if you go to the next slide, um, we do have our contact information. So reach out with uh, questions. Uh, Jeremy, other things we need to cover knowing we're at the top of the hour here? We, we are at the top of the hour and uh, Steve, thanks for this great discussion. Definitely, you know, that can't be the status quo. We definitely want to protect the, the, the protected parties. And I know we don't have a whole lot of time for questions. I, I had just maybe two questions that were industry specific. And, you know, it, so it, it, it's around, you know, any potential, you know, spike in claims around this or, you know, any potential down the road, maybe amending policies, maybe to address these risks. You know, I don't know if maybe you can talk about that because obviously our audiences 
majority, well, not, it's, it's all title professionals. So, you know, that's probably going to be on, on their minds as well. And any, any thoughts or comments on that? Jeremy, we've looked at potential claims um, issues, and, and I think our general thought on that is because so many of these redaction laws are fairly new, and right. you take into account the claims tail and you know the ability to sort of find protected parties or otherwise address potential claims issues that could arise because of redactions. We haven't, we've seen claims, we've been able to resolve them all so far. Um, we haven't seen too many. The thought though is if redactions continue and if you have redactions that are never restored within the chain of title, that's when you're going to see a spike and in increase in claims. Okay. And that's the reason to get ahead of the issue for sure. Okay. Yeah. It, it's the tail of this. That's the real, you know, as time goes on and these are early and we, there's something that's missed. It, it's, we can't answer that question really today other than Liz's point. We got to get ahead of this. So we don't have a tail to deal with from a claims perspective. Okay, all right, thank you for that perspective. Uh, again, if we, uh, as, as Elizabeth mentioned, if you have any questions, follow up, uh, please feel free to reach out to any of the speakers and they'll be more than happy to help you out. I did post the link uh, in the uh, chat box you know, to submit your information for CE, CLE credits. Um, I see some questions that so can't get the um, um, documents. Uh, when you get the email tomorrow with the link to the recording, you also get a link to, to the, uh, the handout. So. No worries about that. Uh, if you did miss uh, parts of today's webinar, if you think others in your office would benefit from listening, um, again, you'll get a, a link to the recording. You can always direct everyone to our website, alta.org forward slash webinars. And with that, uh, that will bring us to the conclusion of today's presentation. Um, Liz, Elizabeth, Steve, thank you again for uh, some of the great insight on uh, the latest on redaction and data showing efforts. Um, to wrap up, I do need to thank Old Republic uh, for sponsoring today's webinar. And uh, take care, everyone. Thank you.